Okay, so we kick off this week's show with another Jake's Take, the behind the scenes of the Bassmaster Elite Series. And as if that wasn't enough, we welcome winner of all things bass fishing and creator for one of the most iconic lines in bass fishing history, Godzilla ain't got nothing on me, Greg Hackney from Gonzales, Louisiana, and Jake Latondras this week on... I'm Bob Cobb from the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Welcome one, welcome all. Thank you for joining me once again. Happy hump day. It is Wednesday. Mercer, the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast, putting hump back in your hump day. And I thank you all for joining me here. This is a big show. We got lots going on this show. Um, of course, we just had an Elite Series event, so we will have a Jake's Take Jake, videographer, camera person, Jake LaTondra is going to join us and uh, break down what he saw at the event. Uh, a lot of insider scoops and that sort of thing. And then the main attraction. 16-time Bassmaster Classic qualifier, former angler of the year and winner in all things fishing, the hack attack, Greg Hackney. So it is a bit of a banger. So rather than me just rambling on and on and you know, taking a while to get there. Let's just get to the main attractions and we'll kick it off. Oh, I'm sorry, I belched there. With Jake Latondras. Quickly becoming, or I think it's already there, the most popular segment in this show, Jake's Take, joined by Jake Latondras. Jake, you're a man of many mysteries. You're you're a former ice climber. You've seen the Grateful Dead 60, <laughs> 64, 67, 67 times. 67, 67 times. 67 times. And uh, you've been on this podcast more than anybody, but welcome back. And uh, we had a freaking crazy week. Oh, my goodness. The weather was crazy. <laughs> yeah. That, that was, makes that it was worse. Like harder on. I, I find after the event, you're just like wore out more. You're, uh, dude, after, after, I mean, that was like Davey Height said. It was the coldest 51 degrees in the history of degrees. <sighs> You know, because he kept looking at his temperature, he said in his truck or on his on his uh, phone, he was out on the water and he's like, man, it feels like it's 28 degrees out here with 95 percent humidity. And he kept looking. It was 51 degrees, but it didn't feel like that at all. I mean, we were the camera trailer. All of us, all 10 of us were freaking just worn down at the end of each day. It was like, man, I'm going to go home and take a hot bath. <laughs> <laughs> a group of men in a trailer talking about. Yeah baths not together <laughs> well no no um before we get into this week i, I want to hit on something um because i haven't really filled you in in this story that much but the reason i drove to this event was because i had to have my boat because i got to do something that has honestly been a bucket list for me um there's a segment in a section of the magazine called day in the lake it's I think the most popular part of Bassmaster magazine and uh, the guy who writes that Don Worth is a hall of fame, a writer. And uh, I, I did not know Don at all, but he set up to do one of these with me and then COVID hit and it was during all the crazy border thing and we couldn't do it. So we did it the day before the tournament and uh, he picks the lake and everything. And you're supposed to know nothing about it. And I mean, wouldn't even give me the, I called him, uh, you know, a day before and I'm like, can you send me the name of the lake so I can Google Earth it? You know, I mean, I still don't know anything. I'm just trying to Google Earth it to get an idea of where we go. That was against the rules. So I was not allowed to do that. But um, it's like the very first classic. <laughs> yeah, basically over and over again. Um, and now I know how I would have done in the very first classic, which wasn't good. Um, <laughs> I'm not allowed to give a result, I guess. Um but I'll tell you this, it was incredibly tough fishing, um, but it was it, it was one of the coolest experiences to be with Don all day. And he's, I mean, he's been with Bass for 50 years. He's seen everything. Um, we shared a lot of stories. And, uh, and the, the reason I'm telling you about all this information is because the fishing wasn't that good. Um, but, it, but it was a bucket list thing for me. And uh, the only thing that makes me feel good about it is it doesn't come out for a year. So hopefully by that time I've accomplished other things and people turn a blind eye to what happened on the water that day. But I did feel better when I got to the tournament because 
a lot of our guys sucked. I mean, it was very similar to, I mean, day one was good there, but it was, it seemed like that side of Tennessee where we were, we were on the far other side. It seemed like that weather came there first because it got real cold while we were shooting, but day one of the elite was still warm. Um, and it, as we learned in this tournament, it seemed like those fish were kind of pushed off a bit and that that's what it felt like in, on day in the lake. But I just wanted to brag about doing day in the lake. Cause it is one of the coolest things that I've ever been asked to do. So thank you very much, Mr. Don worth. If you listen to podcasts, which I don't know if he does. So, so the, your, you, the, the anticipation for you wanting to do this for such a long time was what, like, what were you, what were you in, intrigued by the most well it's just it's something i grew up reading i mean for me every single time i've ever got a bassmaster magazine to this day that's the first thing i flip to you know day in the lake to read that and, and i wondered i said that to don i said i wonder if day in the lake has started to lose some of its magic in the way that we see day on the lake i mean in every day of elite series competition in the past you never saw all those decision-making moments and stuff like that. Um, all the changes and adjustments, but it's just, I think it's just, I grew up, I mean, it, it, I grew up reading it and, and I just always thought, man, it'd be cool to be part of that. And um, do you, think I always imagined I caught them better, to be honest. I, <laughs> in the dreams, I was like, I will hammer them. That's what, that's what every angler thinks going into day one of every tournament. <laughs> I mean, do you did you find yourself feeling like that's probably what these anglers feel like going into a tournament? No, no, because uh, I even though they like have three days more prepared. Um, no, and I, to be honest, dude, I have way past the point of oh, I'm feeling pressure. If I don't catch them today, um, somebody's gonna make fun of me. Uh, sure, I, I that's fishing, and um, so I never like even. It wasn't until the day was done where I was just like, oh, I would have liked to represent a little better. Um, but but I, it just I didn't feel pressure. I just had a really it was just a cool experience. And I, to be honest, I didn't really even think of the anglers. I just was focused on trying to get a freaking bite. Um, <laughs> so and then then what I found out is um, Tennessee is a much larger state than I imagined because uh, I always drive north south through Tennessee and it's not that big. But when you go the other direction, it's it's pretty long. I mean, I, I didn't even put up my GPS till I head to the event, and I was like, "What? Four hours to get there?" And um, it's a long so, state. If you turned it vertical, it would be like I don't know how it would compare to California, but it is a long from Memphis to Johnson City or Kingsport, which is up in the far northeast corner of the state. That would be corner to corner. That's a long. That's like I think it's like seven seven hours from corner to corner, seven or yeah. eight. Uh, yeah. And it's and it's a beautiful drive, but it's not oh. the kind of drive you want to make when you're in a rush. True. Um, so I rolled into town late the night before and you guys had a power outage, but I had no idea there was a power outage. So I'm just like, why are all the restaurants closed? Like there's nowhere to eat. So um, uh, I didn't eat that night, but I'm, I'm OK in that department. I can miss a few meals. The whole town, but the whole town, literally the, the hotel power went down. I was actually editing a little short video. The power went down, so I unplugged everything because it was a storm coming. And then I went downstairs. I grabbed three beers out of the refrigerator, thinking everyone was going to be down there wondering what's going on. And and I was right. <laughs> and and so yeah, the entire town of Dayton, Tennessee, was was in it was out of t power totally, hundred percent. Yeah. So, but I didn't know that. And I found it confusing that every restaurant was closed because they sent their staff home because they were out of power. Because when I was there, power was back. Um, but let's jump into our tournament. Um, let's do it. Day one. Who Lee Livesey, with? day one. Day one. And, and he, he defending champion, def defending champion at Chickamauga, different time of the year. Yeah. Right. Also, uh, like 10 days from having a baby, which is a foolproof pattern on the Elite Series. If you have a baby, a lot of people win tournaments right afterwards. <laughs> he had a he lot on his <laughs> he had a lot on his mind, a lot on his heart. And you know, when he went into the first uh he first of all, he his boat draw was like number 80. I think he was 84 out of the gates on day one. Yeah, which, he was he was boat. 
No, he was he was boat ten on day two. I knew that. Right. Um, so yeah, he was one of the last boats on day day one. Right, and I think you know when a, a lay a big lake like that fish is small, like it does at times. Yeah, you know, in those pockets, people flipping those laydowns. Man, being being late to your spot can be a huge setback for you know your rotation and your plans and what you're going to do first and all that. And I think I think when he rolled into his first pocket, there was like five other boats in there, and mm. every, you know, it was it was like I mean it wasn't like just five any boats. It was like Brock Mosley, <laughs> Caleb Kufal. You know, it was like some some heavy sticks in there fishing shallow water, and they were all sitting on spots that Lee wanted to go fish. So, and he didn't know he hadn't seen that many people in there during practice. Yeah. So he was fairly optimistic that he was going to go in there and and you know make a run just coming right out of the gates on day one. Cause I think he, I think he felt like he was going to catch 22 to 24 pounds the first day. And that didn't happen. So anything learned from that? I mean, I mean, you had yeah. a good time. I mean, you and Lee are super tight. I mean, uh, yeah, you, we, I mean, uh, we had fun, but you know, again, when, when things start to unravel a bit, I get quiet because they're thinking and they, yeah. you know, they're very, you can tell they're thinking. And like, if I said, Hey man, how was whiskey? You know, how <laughs> you going to go to the whiskey Myers concert? It would have been like, he would have been like, dude, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm focused right now, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. um, but he did, he ended up, I forget what he weighed. I think he weighed. I think maybe it was like 16. 13. Was yeah. it 13? 13 or 14 pounds. I mean, he maybe was 13, right. 10 or 13, yeah. 14 or something like that. And to be honest with you at one thirty, he only had one fish in the boat. Yeah, It was a dink. And so, you know, he, he just went fishing again. We always talk about how when everything else fails, these guys are good enough. They just go fishing, you know, and use their instincts. And he ended up filling his bag and, and bringing five fish to the, to the weigh in. And, you know, I felt like he felt disappointed and understandably so, but I felt like he worked really hard and he went and found some fish to salvage the day. Which, which I thought he did. Yeah, and, and if you look at the guys that were on that first area, you know, like you said, Brock and Caleb Kufal, I mean, two of the guys who made it all the way through to Sunday. I don't think people realize how often the, the difference between success and failure is razor thin. Like, just simply, you know, your boat draw order. Just being, exactly. you know, later to the spot and not getting that opportunity. I mean, uh, it could have been a whole different tournament for him. And I think, de- you know, in a in a... Uh, the way the lake had set up for that tournament, you know, day two, those, all those guys had already been in there. Plus who know, who knows who else had been in that pocket fishing, you know, once Lee left and you really didn't know who was in there. I think, I think, uh, uh, I mean, I think a lot of people came in and out of that cove and for, you know, the way it's set up for day two, he was 10th coming out of the gate, but, I mean, those guys had already flipped all those treetops and I mean, it was, it was already burned before he got there on day two. So, you know, it was, it was a tough, tough gig for him. Yeah. Well, that night I I got to make (laughs) him feel better about things. Um, Cause we did something that, uh, to be honest, I've never done. I mean, in 12 years working for Bass, I mean, we talk a big game on stage, you know, we'll be like, we're going to party, we're going to do whatever. But to be totally honest, we don't. I mean, we're there for work. We go to bed early. Um, We get up ridiculously early. But 45 minutes up the road in Chattanooga, Lee Livesey's friends slash sponsors, Whiskey Myers is playing. And it became a thing. I mean, everybody kind of knew about it on stage. Half the field was going to this concert on stage. Um, but, But we got together that night and... I, I really didn't think we were going to go. Um, it was, you know, it was talk. And then we, we said, we'll go to dinner. And um, we went to dinner and I'm like, yeah, we, we're going to talk. And then we're going to go to dinner and they're going to have a drink. And everybody will be like, hey, I'm not going to a concert. I'm going to bed because that's kind of what always happens. Well, Davey Height shows up and he has these, I mean, he and he thinks we're just making fun of his boots. I am not making fun of his boots. There is a certain pressure that myself, Lee, and uh, Caleb, Summerall, not Kufal, um, felt because the three of us are standing there and Davey comes rolling out and he's got his 
boots on and super starch jeans, and he is ready to have the night of a Southern gentleman's life. Uh, <laughs> so we're, we're all like, we all had the exact same reaction. Like I saw him first and then we went over to their hotel and then uh, Caleb and Lee, and we're like, Whoa, Davey's got boots on. So I think the boots and Mark Zona ridiculing us is what really fueled it. Um, Cause he's like, you gotta go, you gotta go. If I was there, I'd so go, which is such a lie. Uh, Zona would be in bed, but it was the best bad decision I ever made my whole life. I mean, we didn't get home till close to two in the morning. Um, and I learned about the worst feature on the new website where it counts down how long you have till weigh in and how long you have till takeoff. And I looked and it was not a lot of hours, um, <laughs> until takeoff. So it, uh, it was a bad decision, but man, it was an incredible concert. That's how you want to go to a concert. I mean, we, Literally, I didn't even know the venue it was in to this day. Like, I, I, they played somewhere in Chattanooga. We had a big, you know, theater type seating. Um, they gave us, you know, Lee talking to them, gave us the address right to go to. We parked the guy. We're coming down the road and their tour buses are there. And the guy comes out, moves the barricade. And he says, see where that no parking sign is? Park right there. We parked right beside it walked in the back door, up the stairs, and we were right in the side of the stage, the whole concert. It was incredible. Um, and uh, I've never met cooler guys. I mean, I've always been a big fan of, of Whiskey Myers, but they are honestly some of the best people I've ever met. In a world where you just hear people like that, you know, doing dumb crap, they are just really good people. I mean, they love fishing. It's not just a little bit like you were listening to them talk and they were like, well, you didn't have a fish at one o'clock Lee. And I'm like, you guys are following it that close that you're, you know, that into it. But like everybody um, was just incredible. Um, so I became an even bigger fan of them. And then afterwards we went in the tour bus, um, which was, which was fun. Um, it was a lot of fun just hanging out with them. Just, I mean, everybody, I mean, their bus driver knew my name. I walk on and he's like, Mercer. And they were like, thanking wow. Davey for coming. I can't believe a Bassmaster Classic Champions at our show and stuff. And wow. it's just so cool to see like. How cool know, is he, that, that they relate to what we do and to Lee, they sponsor Lee. Yeah. And, and their music, their music is just, it's so fitting Really, it fits Lee very well, his style, yeah. and 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 everybody loves their music. You know, you and I were talking about before we started recording this what they, what what they remind us of. Who do they remind you of? They're modern day Leonard Skinner, I think. You know, and and I felt more so after seeing them because their show is so interactive. Their show has got so much going on. It's not. There's a lot of bands nowadays where dude just stands in front of the mic and there's no movement or anything, but their show is. Like a Skinner show. So I'd say they're a modern day Leonard Skinner. Yeah, my my take on them, I listen to them all the time now. And my take on them is a mix between ZZ or amongst ZZ Top, some Molly Hatchet, uh, Leonard Skinner for sure. Like that's the first thing that pops into my head. But then I hear a huge influence or at least a similarity to the Black Crows. And it's just yeah. got this cool vibe. And they go, you know, they go way high and then they can they can slow down too. And it's all everything in between is really, really good music. They're 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 badass. Yeah, they're incredible. Um and, and the funny thing was it's so cool to see people in their environment. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's like watching you guys work. I mean, there's no stress. You're calm. You, this is what you do. You know what I mean? And everybody's kind of like that in their own gig. But so they, they were out there already when we got there, they had already gone on the stage. That's how late, you know, our game time decision was. Um, and Cody comes over lead singer. He comes over to the side of the stage and dude, he's like, ripping on his guitar he's got like a four minute section where he's playing the guitar and he's literally hammering straight. like he's just but just talking to us like you know he's just like so i'm so thankful you guys came and you know like he's scrambling eggs while he's talking to you yeah, guys like but he's nothing. ripping it's the guitar great example that's literally what it was like somebody just sitting there cooking and talking and <laughs> and um and he's like, you're going to stick around afterwards right like you're not going to leave you guys got to stay and have a beer on the tour bus and and we said, okay. And then, and then dude, like he walks away from us. So he's been back there for like three or four minutes, like talking to us about everything. Like 
And then he walks back out to the crowd. And then you just realize, I'm like, this dude is a freaking rock star. I mean, because he walks in front of the mic and at that point just goes like, and then every, every girl in the entire building just <laughs> screaming. And it's just like, wow, they just, it's so cool that, that they know that that's all fake. You know what I mean? They're so thankful for the fans and everybody, but they, they get life. Like, I mean, we were in their tour bus. All they wanted to talk about was fishing and, um, <laughs> It's really cool. So if you do not listen to Whiskey Myers, you need to listen to it because it's badass music, but it is also you're supporting good people, you know, really good people that support our sport, that support uh, an angler in our sport. And like every single person that works for them, the the bus driver, their stage manager, uh, every single person, you know, stage manager, Chris is like, I went to high school with them. You know what I mean? They're all people that are connected and you know, and that's another thing you hear nowadays. A lot of people just, you know, firing through different employees and stuff when they get to that level. Everyone around them is people that that, that they're bringing up with them. So it's uh, and very, if you very love, cool. If you love rock and roll, particularly Southern rock and roll, I guarantee you, if you have not listened to them, shuffle through their songs and you're going to find a, a bunch of songs that you really, really like. Yeah. From lyrics to the to the riffs and everything in between. I, I love them. They're, they're awesome. I can't wait. So I'm going to say this publicly. You guys need to come to red rocks oh, on June the 6th, right after Pickwick, because I'm going, Lee got me into that show and I, it won't be this. If I have to go with one other person or something, it just wouldn't be the same without you guys. So I hope y'all come. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to try. I'm going to try. I mean, that's how, um, how impressed I was and, and Red Rocks is somewhere I've always wanted to go. And that's actually, we got talking about it that night. That's a gig that they're so looking forward to. Cause that's kind of a bucket list place to perform. It's a shrine. And yeah. Yeah. And ultimately I'm just hoping to become really good friends with them and have them bring me up with them and I'll just be their <laughs> intro guy. I mean, I'll just, what are you doing? Uh, wherever they tell me to go, I just warm up the crowd. <laughs> Dude. How cool. No, 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 no. Uh, 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 how cool would that be if you walked out on stage and introduced the freaking band at a show? Oh my God. What an idea. That would be freaking unbelievable. Uh, I've done it. <laughs> like at all the TTBCs, I, I introduced all, you know, Trace Atkins and a bunch of different people, but it would be so much cooler with those guys. Cause number one, oh. like it's a real connection. Um, you, you the know, electricity like, at a show like that oh, too. It's just like, dude, come on, man. <laughs> I don't know how they're all not messed up. Like I say that, like I get jacked from the classic and remember I'm just there introducing the people that people come to see. But if you just were one of those people that like literally every time he goes like this, <laughs> I would laugh because you'd just be like, all he did was that. And like, I'm a running around a friggin' elite series stage, sweating and spinning towels and crap to get people to make noise. And he just goes, he's like some crusade leader or something, you know? <laughs> so the, awesome. The DJ plays Whiskey Myers now, you know, before takeoff uh -huh. almost every morning. And it's, uh, it's just great. It's just great. Yeah. So great time. I got home way too late. Um, day two of the tournament. Let's get back into it. Cause there's some people who don't care about <laughs> day in the lake or about Whiskey Myers. And they're like, just tell me about the tournament. So day two of the tournament. You are no longer with Lee Livesey because he falls out of the top 10. And uh, who are you with? I was with Daisuke Aoki. How come who, you are always with the Japanese anglers? It all started when they put me with uh, Takahiro Omori on Wheeler. When he won that event, they put me with him on day three. And then I had him again on day four and he ended up winning. And... I remember them saying on calm, even though that wasn't live back then, that yeah. was, you know, uh, banked, banked, uh, clips for, the, uh, an edited show. They talked about how more comfortable he was, but cause again, my mother is Japanese and I can speak a little bit of Japanese. And so I can relate to them, at least make them laugh. And I think they feel more comfortable. So now after that event, they put me with the Japanese guys. And to be honest with you, I love it. And, and I'll be honest with you. My mom is so proud of the fact that they do that because as you know, I mean, when you're a superstar in America, 
you're a much bigger superstar in Japan. And these people are like folk heroes, Taku really? Ito, Takahiro Omori. Like they're bass fishermen, and people don't realize how big bass fishing is in Japan. I mean, I remember we had – we had exchange students come from Japan to live with us in our home when I was a little kid, like in elementary school. And they worked for my dad because he was in the pearl business. And these Japanese guys would, would bring. The more I know about you, the more. I mean, it's just <laughs> layers. It's. <laughs> of so, course, your dad was in the pearl business. We're going to talk about layers <laughs> later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so, and so. I, you know, even as a child, I had people coming to our home, bringing, bringing like fishing equipment to our house, uh, in the likes of brands like Daiwa and, and Shimano and no one else heard of them. Cause back then it was Shakespeare or whatever, or Abu Garcia. And, and so, you know, it's really fascinating for me now to look back on my childhood and know how into bass fishing these Japanese uh, guys were. They were either teenagers or in their early 20s. And to look at it now and how big it is. And Daisuke, I will say this about Daisuke, and I love Taku Ito. He's fabulous. And we're great friends. I love the guy. I love Tak, all those guys. Kenta. But I will say this, that Daisuke he just his style of fishing and his adaptability. I feel like of all the Japanese guys that I've been in the boat with, he's the most well-rounded and he's, he's very, he's very well-rounded. He has his finesse techniques that are very Japanese style and he goes to that, those guns first. But if that's not working, he pulls out the flipping stick and he's jerking them out of the treetops. He's, yeah. he's really, really good at it. Of the Japanese guys. I mean, obviously Takahiro is the most accomplished Japanese angler. Nobody's going to argue that at all. No. But I would say that Daisuke comes with the most, uh, the biggest uh, pedigree from Japan, really. You know what I mean? He's won Angler of the Year three times there. He's won their Classic twice. Um, When you look at a lot of the Japanese guys, I mean, they kind of did some stuff in Japan, but they they headed here and, and accomplished what they did. Um, so he definitely comes in as, as a guy with the most pedigree. And I was, I was shocked at his first three elite series events because he has kind of struggled. And I really, and the, you know, Florida, you kind of give him a pass because one big bite, you can change your entire life. And it can also, if you don't get that, it, it, it's a horrible tournament, but, um, it was good to see him do well. So you, you got to, so once you got in the boat with him, I mean, you were with him till the end of the tournament because he, I don't think he ever fell out of the top three, did he? No, he, he, uh, he stayed in the top three, the entire day two, day three and day four. And he led the tournament, you know, he was back and forth leading the tournament during the day several times. Yeah. And he was on a cool, he was on a good pattern. I was going to say this, you know, the first time I really paid attention to Daisuke was when Polinick went to Japan. Yeah. And they fished together, and Polinick took uh, some prototypes of the Arashi glide bait, and they used it on Lake Biwa, which it actually holds the the world record, or it did the world record largemouth bass. They didn't which, give it to him. You know what? That, that it's bigger oh, than didn't? the world record. But listen to okay. how stupid this is. Um, you have to beat a world record by two or three ounces. I'm not sure which it is. Oh. Two or three ounces. You have to beat it by. This only beat it by two. Uh, it was an ounce short of beating it by the total amount anyways. But my theory on it is like the world record that George Perry caught way back when scales are better today. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> then. So I'm like, it's kind of dumb, but yeah, no, I, I think it's widely accepted as, as a the co- biggest world. bass ever caught. You know, yeah, the biggest whatever. bass ever caught. Um, yeah, yeah. So then they go to Lake Biwa, which is a, a an extremely high pressure lake. Mo is combat fishing, like people fish for salmon up in, you know, yeah. the Dog Salmon River in Alaska. It's like that. They're side by side. And they go out on a boat and 
pollinant catch is like, I forget if it was six or eight pounds, but their goal was to catch a big bass in Lake Biwa, which a lot of people deem is virtually impossible. And they go out there and catch this big bass. And, and Brandon sent me a video clip of it. He texted it to me and I was watching it going, oh my God, this is un like, what a great experience. That's when I first started paying attention to Daisuke and what his accolades or his accomplishments and all the things that he brings to the table to America. And I found out, um, you know, this this past weekend exactly why he has been so why he has accomplished so much in Japan, because he's really he's really good at it. He really is. Yeah. Yeah. Him and Paul Nick did uh, a whole video together. You know, we're bigger than fish. And I think it was called. Um, and, and because they both won angler of the year at the same year in, in two different countries. And, and right. number one, how, how well ahead of his time is once again, Brandon Paul Nick thinking of stuff like that. I'll put a link below somewhere to a link to that actual video. Cause it is a cool On video YouTube, to watch. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what stood out to you? How was he fishing that it stood out to you as, as different and, and what did he do? to get the finish that he did because in a tournament where we saw leaders go up and down, I mean, the eventual winner had to climb every day, you know, um, dice Gabe was incredibly consistent. Yeah. So he was mostly offshore. In fact, unless until really day four, when things, when it got slick on him, calm and slick, he stayed offshore the entire time and he had a really great rotation. No one was around him. He was out on the open water and he had these humps that he was fishing when in the, in the wind was his best friend. And as you know, it was pretty windy <laughs> day two and day three. It was, it was miserably windy yeah. and cold out there. So he was throwing this little, I don't even know what you call it. A little plastic bait on a round, just a standard, it wasn't, it didn't have any color, but it was a round ball head jig with a straight shank hook. And he had some kind of, you know, uh, blue and yellow and silver flashy uh, minnow split tail minnow yeah. imitator on it. And no he was action. No, no action. That, and that's a technique in Japan where they don't, you know, that it, it, everything you have to impart yourself, basically. Exactly. And he, and his act, his action came from him. Uh, vibrating his rod tip again right and i asked him about that off camera i'm like like why because he was reeling he wasn't like drew cook vibrating yeah. his rod on a bed he was reeling it retrieving his bait and he was shaking his rod as you know as as hard almost as hard as drew cook did yeah at, at santee cooper and i asked him i said what does that do to the bait and he says he says it rolls it so while he's retrieving it, it's rolling it, and that's what the fish liked. And he was catching the, – the, the, the only problem that I felt like he had was that the big fish on the flats that he was catching were – four and five pounders and i'm not saying i'm no genius and i'm not i'm certainly not a professional bass angler and i had no underwater cameras to 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 you know to to prove what i'm saying yeah. but i felt like this was a this was a there, there were some bigger fish coming up on that flat to feed when especially when it got windy but I, I didn't feel that six, seven or eight or nine pounder coming up because they were doing something else. Yeah. And, and I felt like on, on day four, when we went, you know, into the final day, it was ca slick, calm. He went to his flats and it was nothing. And then the sun came out and it got worse. And I felt like this is where, this is where it's going to be interesting to see how he ad adapts to this to, and see what he's going to do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I, I mean, a lot of people thought he was going to win it. You know what I mean? Like what, with the way his bite was, I, I would have thought, I mean, when it slicks off, it gets tough for everybody, but I just thought would have thought it would go, it would have gotten less tough for him in that situation. I, I want, I mean, obviously whoever's boat I'm in, I want them to win. Like I'm their biggest fan at that point. Once I jump in their boat, but going out, when we left day on day four that morning, I felt like this was going to be difficult because 
he he was he was doing this on four and five pounders, and I felt like whoever's going to win this is probably going to stick one of those one or two of those six, seven, eight, nine pounders, and then it was going to be over. That that's just how I felt when we left. Yeah, was anyone else out there fishing near him? It, it always looked like he was by himself every time I saw. There were locals, <laughs> but no, no, uh, no, no profession other professional anglers out there at all. Huh. Huh. He had it all to himself and it was cool, man. I mean, it was, he definitely had found these really cool patterns that were working for him. But again, even when there was a chop and they weren't biting when the, when the gusts came up and it was really blowing over the top of those flats, that's when he caught every fish. He, and he wasn't solely like fishing that way. You would think, especially nowadays, you would think it's all um, forward-facing sonar. It seemed like, you know, he caught a few fish that way, but I, I didn't – his game plan wasn't all forward-facing sonar, was it? Um, I think a lot of it was on those open flats. When he adjusted and he went to the bank, obviously that, that was different. And, you know, we should mention, too, that he started every morning back. He had to go through that tunnel, and I don't know what that little pocket was called. I know people call it wheelers. Wheeler's pocket or Wheeler's pond or whatever, because because Wheeler fishes there a lot. Mm-hmm. But he went back into that into that that drainage and that ditch, and it was like you know it was it was it had a split in it, it had two wings on it, and he was going up and down the bank. But again, he was finesse fishing, and uh, he was throwing a wacky rig in there, and he was catching his fish. He wasn't, he wasn't throwing, he wasn't fishing the treetops or the laydowns. He was fishing in the open space between the, the laydowns. And that's where he was catching his fish, which I found to be really interesting. And I'm sitting there going, you know, maybe, maybe he's going to go through here and throw that wacky rig in between these laydowns. And then he's going to come back through and flip those treetops. Cause there has to be, if there's fish between them. There has to be fish in those laydowns, right? You you would assume. You would think. I mean, is that where he was fishing the four pound test that everybody was talking about? Is that that, that when he got ultra finesse? That's when he got ultra finesse, and it was ultra finesse. I mean, every, and you know, I kept waiting for him to hook into a six pounder, and and you know how how's he gonna how's he gonna how's he gonna land this fish? <laughs> But again, it's all Japanese style, you know, and you, when you're in the boat with those guys, the Japanese guys, they're always doing something different and they always fish smaller baits than what you would think they should be fishing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, that's, I mean, and that's how fishing is there. And that's why you hear Takumi talking about, I don't like big fish. I mean, (laughs) actually I heard a few times Daisuke caught a small one and he's like, Japanese size bass. <laughs> uh, yeah, right, right. <laughs> they're they're so much fun. Their attitude, you know, they're they're so polite and so yeah. kind and all that. And their attitude is always so positive. Um, and they're 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 a lot of fun to fish with. And and I'm always glad to see one of those guys in the top ten because I know I'm going to get in their boat and it's going to be a fun <laughs> and different kind of day. So everybody's disappointed that you weren't in Jason Christie's boat now, all of a sudden. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there's other camera people that work. And first of all, I got to say this about all the camera people. I sent Wes a text to Wes Miller. Is, what would he be the, what's I don't know if he's got a handle, but he, he runs the camera crew basically. You know what I mean? He's we the, look at him like he's our boss, even yeah. though, I mean, he's part of the camera crew, but he's been there for, I forget how many, you know, 20 some odd years he's been there a long time i mean yeah. he was filming danny bauer back in the day right yeah, and yeah. so you know we all we all look to him when we have issues we always look to wes um you know to get us out of a jam we look at him uh for advice and we all respect him as our as our leader in the camera trailer yeah well, i sent him a text afterwards and said man that the team of shooters you guys have an incredible team of shooters and a weekend like this past weekend is so much harder on you guys almost than anybody else. Um, and I just said kudos to your team because I mean, I watched after the tournament, I watched you guys all get in a circle and meet and it's, it's pretty cool to, to just see 
the interaction amongst the uh, amongst the camera team and and I just I wanted to tell him man you guys are incredible at what you do and and you would expect to hear some whining and stuff like that on it in tough conditions because I mean I was whining um so <laughs> but but it, it's it's a great crew of, of shooters so it is and and to, just so you know we haven't talked about this at all but we went to dinner Sunday night yeah. at that brewery which I had called you about yeah. and when we're sitting there eating dinner, your text came through to him and he, he opened it up and he showed us all and read the text. So thank you very much for, for, for saying all those things. And, and we, we really appreciate it. Cause I mean, I get, I get, you know, we don't get, those guys don't get the credit that this whole team deserves. And like you said, when we have events like that and it's cold and miserable out there, we just go. We it's like we, we we talk about this a lot in the camera trailer. We're we're suiting up. It's like and, and don't take this the wrong way to all you veterans out there because we appreciate you. It's just an analogy, but it's almost like we're getting dressed up for battle, you yeah. know. And 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 it has that same kind of feel. So yeah, kudos to the entire camera team. Yeah, a great a great crew. Does it feel weird like when you're so synonymous with like? The Christie thing. I mean, it's been way it played out everywhere. Everybody kind of sees your relationship. Jason's talked about it. You've talked about it. Overcoming everything and kind of feeling like the classic was a victory together. Is there part of you that's just kind of like, well, he's with that guy now. <laughs> is there like a weirdness? Yeah, there. I mean, it kind of is like it's like it's you want you want everything to go well but you also want to be there you want to, you want to be there for all of them after after you you know experience the things that i have with jason brandon polinick lee livesey all those guys you know i mean like um uh brian evey you know he filmed he filmed Bill Lowen win at Pickwick last yeah. year. And that's an experience they'll always share for the rest of their lives. And there's something significant about that. Not just, you know, it's not your ego. It's something emotional and it's something you're very proud of. And you were, you were the only person there to experience that, that situation. And it, like we've talked about this many times. It becomes a lifelong relationship after that so yeah you, you know when someone i'm like okay i want to be with dice k just like i was with quentin capo on fork last year and i'm watching bass track and i'm listening to calm and lee livesey's out there smacking eight pounders you know on top water and i'm just going oh my god i wish i i want i'm i'm glad i'm with quentin right now but man i wish i was with lee at, at this point but you yeah know, i'm proud for those guys too that was a life-changing experience for hunter Lindsay, you know yeah. Yeah. It, it, um, one day at takeoff, I noticed, I don't know what happened, but one day at takeoff, it, Dice K was out of order, whether it was day two or day three, at some point he was out of order. I think it might've been day two and you were running up and down the bank or whatever. What was happening that day? No, yeah, it was day, it was day three. He, his running light, his red running light oh. was out and he came to the 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 live well boat, the pontoon where they were checking live wells, and they mentioned to him, "Your running lights out. We can't let you go. You have to go get this fixed because that's one of the requirements, right? Yeah. It's all about safety when you're when you're when you're running out there, you know, coming out of takeoff. It's all about safety, and it always is. Life jackets, running lights, all that. So Daisuke, he didn't understand. He was like, "Oh, uh, what? What?" And they were telling him, no, 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 you can't go. And he shut his live wells. Like, he sat down like he's getting ready to take off. And I said, no, Daisuke, no, Dame. Dame means damage. So I went to the front of the boat, and I pointed to his his red light, and I said, Dame, fix. So he goes, oh, oh, okay, 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 okay. So he turns around, and he's weaving back through the line of boats coming through the check start before they take off. He goes back to the, the boat ramp peninsula because that's where someone had said the service trailer was. Yeah. And I jumped out of the boat because he he was still sort of confused about what he had to do. He didn't know where to go, who to talk to or anything. 
So th this is actually a pretty cool story. So I jump out of the boat. I run to the top of the hill. I've got my phone with me trying to figure out who to call. I yeah. almost called you, but I knew you had a mic in your hand and you were super busy, but I didn't know where to go either because I get to the, to the, the parking spaces and there's no service trailer up there. So I come back down and I run over to the, to, to where the boat, the, the floating dock was and Taku Ito, he jumps up and he said, Jake, what's wrong? Cause he could see panic in yeah. me. And I said, I need you to come help translate. So Taku jumps out of his boat and mind you, all the, these guys are like, and take off ready. happening during this. Like it's, there's already boats ahead that have, that are going out. Okay. So Scott Canterbury, Bob Downey and Taku Ito were all gathered around Daisuke's boat trying to help him figure this out. Wow. And it was like, dude, this is the coolest behind the scenes story that no one's ever going to hear about until we come on Mercer's show. <laughs> <laughs> and so Canterbury's like, just go, just go. And, and he was telling me that. And I said, they won't let him go. He can't. He goes, well, what are y'all going to do? Bob down is so Marshall. I'm, I'm, I'm God go. <laughs> I'm out. I'm done. I'm, I'm out of here. I'm just blowing past him. Taku is, is translating to Daisuke what's going on. Meanwhile, Bob Downey's Marshall pulls out a headlamp that has a red light switch on it. Bob Downey grabs it, jumps out of his boat, grabs duct tape. Okay. Out of his boat, runs over to Daisuke's boat, duct tapes a red headlamp onto the front of Daisuke's boat and says, go. So we back out, pull the power oh, poles up, back out, and we go weaving back up through the boats. And John uh, uh, Cox is standing there, or he's, he's about to pull up to the check-in boat or check-out boat, whatever you call it, and says, go right ahead, because he had kind of seen what was going on. So he lets Daisuke cut in front of him, and we get up there, and Daisuke's going, ah, he's speaking Japanese. And I, I looked up at the, the uh, check guys, and I, live will check guys, and I said, he's got a red light. So they check it, and they say, okay, go, go, you're in. So then we, we take off. And it's a long idle out of there, you know, to Blue Water, but – uh, yeah, it worked out, and he. I think he lost about five to seven minutes of time, disappointingly, because he was in second out of the gates because he yeah. was in second that day. But when we pulled up to his first spot, no one was there, so I don't think it really cost him anything other than a learning experience. Yeah, it's weird because things like that happen. Uh, you know, a lot of times they'll, they're happening, and – you know, we're introducing boats and I'm like, well, where's dice can? And, and I'll always just introduce them in case I don't see them for some reason. So I introduced him. And then I remember like later on, oh, there's dice K and you know, it all worked out, but it, right. uh, it, it's, uh, that was quite the freaking conundrum. A lot of well, different it, people involved. <laughs> well, you know, and two, those running lights are molded into the, into the body of the boats. A yeah. lot of the a lot of the style boats now have the those lights yeah, molded them, yeah. into the side, so it's not like you can just pop the cap off of it and you know change a bulb out or figure out if it was wiring. And it turned out to be wiring because he got it fixed when he got back that afternoon. Yeah, how is he the, as an angle? Like, I mean, does he stand out as different? But with all the accomplishments, I mean, like you talk to. Takumi and all those that like Sago will tell you, I mean, he is, he's their guy. Like, th does he stand out as that way when you're fishing with them? That like, is there a bit of an aura around him type thing? I think so. A hundred percent. Um, he, he adjusted really well. And I kept thinking, man, like one of the things that he didn't do was spend too much time on a place that wasn't producing. Like mm -hmm. he would give it, and I noticed that a long time ago about Takahiro Omori as well. I remember we pulled up on the spot he won uh, Wheeler Lake on. And I remember him saying specifically to me, he said, uh, we're going to know if they're here in his broken, in broken English. We will know if they're here in five minutes. No five-minute catch, we're, we're out. So they know they, they, they don't spend a lot of time. And I think that goes – that's something that's in the Japanese style or in their mentality or whatever. If they're wa they're not going to waste much time. Right. And so, uh, Daisuke was very quick 
to give it just enough time to know that he's not going to get a bite here. And he would say, okay, moving. And we pack up, we go to the next spot, we go to the next spot. There's probably 10 to 15 minutes if he wasn't getting a bite right where he knew on the exact cast where he should have been getting bit, he would move. So finally I kept thinking, man, the sun's out, it's slick, calm. I wonder if he's going to move back to the trees or get in the shade or go to the boat docks. No more than did I think that. And, and actually, uh, Lee Livesey was already at home and he was watching live and he texted me. He's like, dude, why is he not moving to the boat docks? Literally the very next move he made was to the boat docks and he's flipping. Now he's flipping in the boat docks and he's flipping under the first floats, the, the, the docks that had floats, which very few, most of them were on stilts on, uh, you know, they were, they yeah. were stationary docks but some of them had floats and he would go to that first float and start flipping under that first float and he caught he caught a couple his first cast first flip he caught one which i think was barely a keeper but it was still a keeper because he only had one fish at that time then he went to the rip wrap and he started flipping in and throwing a wacky rig into the shaded areas amongst big boulders and he started catching fish he didn't catch. He only brought three to the scales on the last day, yeah. but he caught a lot of fish. And I think he made, he made some adjustments that, 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 you know, that could have produced something for him had he caught the right fish. Yeah. That last day was weird. I mean, it was just such a, um, in some ways a letdown, you know what I mean? Like it was cool to see Christy win, but it was, I don't think anybody was idling into that way in thinking, man, I I've done enough to win. I mean, everybody thought they, they didn't catch him that day. And, uh, Jason I mean, Christie didn't catch pounds. him by the most. <laughs> right. He won, he won with 15, 10, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, Lake Chickamauga, you know what I mean? Right. Like it, it's, and, and he I went kept from, saying that on live, I kept saying there's going to be, and people think you just said, but I really did feel like at some point somebody's going to get an opportunity those final few hours to get a seven or an eight pounder. I mean, it, it, it's just, it can happen too quick there, but it never I mean, he did. went from 18 to 20 to 21 and then back down to 15. And I kept thinking to myself too, as I was listening to, you know, calm and watching bass track and, you know, you're all, you, we know what's going on. Our angler has no clue what's going on and and like you just said i bet jason was sitting there going man i've only got 50 he probably thought he had 14 and a half or something like that because they always undercut what they really have yeah. and he probably thought well I, you know i'm not gonna win this i bet all of them thought the same thing because none of them had big bags yeah uh, how do you how did dice k feel at the end of it all i mean my, he has to feel like it was a big event for him. I mean, his first top 10, the first time a lot of Bassmaster fans got to see that. I mean, he was on camera for three days in a row, so he owns the bait company that's on the side of his boat. So I'm sure he took looks at it as a big victory. What's that called? D-Style? D-Style, yeah. yeah D-Style. Big, um, it's big in Japan. Like, it's really... I bet. It, it, it's it's a, a high-end bait company, you know, and it's, it's very well re regarded. So when I shot, we shot the interview, you know, we always sit down and shoot an interview with the angler when they come in yeah. on each day. And probably the most important one is the end of day four. When they come in, we shoot the interview and just say, you know, my question is, how do you feel about today? You know, what went right and what went wrong and, and how are you feeling right now? And he said, he did, he did point his finger at the wind. He said, I pretty much knew that when it got calm and slick that I was going to be in trouble because while I could go to the bank, that was my, that was my bread and butter the entire tournament and it literally shut down on him. So, you know, he, he knew, he knew and he took it. I think he took it well. He, he still tried. He fished up until the last minute. Um, uh, which brings up a whole nother topic at some point, but, <laughs> but, uh, you know, he fished to the last the minute, goods, the goods are still coming. Just trust me. Let trust, me. trust us. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, he, I think he, he accepted it like a, an honorable 
Japanese yeah. man would. Hey, man, I made it to the top 10. That's great. But I'm going to go fix what what went wrong today. And I'm going to figure this out next time. Yeah. And he's a cool seem, dude. Yeah. He seemed, he seemed very much. And I, I haven't got to spend a lot of time with him. You know what I mean? Just on stage. And, and, um, most, most Japanese anglers communication on stage is harder than it is, you know, because you're, I mean, it is harder for everybody. So it's, it's harder if it's your second language. Um, so I haven't got to get to know him a bit, but just watching him compete. I mean, he definitely, um, he definitely seems like, as built, you know what I mean? Like he, he, he's a great competitor, but uh, a fun guy, or did you ever get there? Was, was, Oh like- yeah. Oh yeah. We had fun because we talked about, you know, when he caught a little fish, I would call it sushi and he'd start, <laughs> he'd go, ha ha ha. I start laughing. We, we had a, a lot of fun. I just noticed he went and followed my Instagram page this morning. Um, and his bait company, the people that run his company were following my page and they were sending me DMS throughout the day on Instagram. Um, so I had fun with Daisuke, um, as I always do. And I will say this about him too, of all the Japanese anglers on the tour, on tour right now, he has the, he speaks the least amount of English. So he's the most challenging to communicate with. And so a lot of body language and one word, you know, similar words that you can identify. It's like charades almost um, come into play with uh, communicating with Daisuke. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, um, it's amazing what all those guys overcome to be here. You know what I mean? Like when you look at it and, and you've, Got people saying, oh, you can't do this unless of this, this and that. And everything that those those anglers overcome. And and it's pretty awesome to see, you know what I mean? Like how international the sport's getting. You know, obviously you got the Canadian guys, you, you Japanese guys. Carl was a big Australian. player in this event, you know, from Australia. Um, you got anything else on Daisuke before we talk about the creature that can't be beat? That is Jason Christie. <laughs> I mean... You know, I had. Well, we, I had, we got more of that. Don't worry. Yeah. We're not going to get into that. Yeah. yeah. We, we got to, nope. let's be honest. We have a whole. Jake has a story that we can't even tell right here. And Jake almost wasn't going to tell this story. We're going to do a second episode. We're going to, for the first time ever, we're going to have a special. We're going to have a special. We're throwing around different names. Um, but I think the idea is we're going to release it Friday. Um, because this would just get way too long if we get into that. So, so we are skipping over something. If it seems like we're skipping over something, we're skipping over so we can get it ready, and you guys can. <laughs> and you're gonna want to fully into absorb this it. <laughs> Unbelievable experience I've I've <laughs> never had before, and I hope to never have again. <laughs> Everybody's worst nightmare. Right. Um, and speaking of everyone's worst nightmare, Jason Christie, man. Um, It's just, it's so fitting to me. Like, you know, he has been crushed several times. Like as much as he's accomplished, he's also been this close, you know, an angler of the year in the classic several times to see him getting on, you know, a a role now um, makes him just so much scarier to compete against. Um, But, but uh, it's good to see though, too. Like, I mean, it's not like he hasn't, I walked off the stage and Brock was, um, just sitting on, sitting on his, you know, his butt with his knees in front of him and his kid was visiting with him and he was on the phone, you know, probably doing some kind of interview or something. And, you know, I'm looking at Christy's got a lineup of people around him and doing media stuff and Brock's just sitting down there. And I'm like, man, but I've seen Christy as the guy that was sitting on his knees on the ground too. It's just uh, the agony of defeat. The agony yeah. of defeat is hard. You know, and and as uh, as fans and friends of these anglers, you hate that. You just yeah. like God, you feel terrible. But we, are, like you just said, if there's anyone that creates an irony around the situation for Brock Mosley, it's Jason Christie. Yeah. And ironically enough, even more ironically, is that of the five times that Brock Mosley has been the bridesmaid of of these events, Jason Christie has beat him three of those five times. And so, and you, the only words you can say to Brock Mosley are 
dude, your day is coming. And it is. He's a stud. Yeah. He is a d- stud fisherman. I mean, he is a stick. Yeah. So his day's yeah. coming. I talked to him backstage and I talked to his family and I was like, yeah, I know we've had this chat before, but it is, <laughs> trust me. It's, and I don't think Brock felt that bad about this one, to he be didn't. honest, because he said on day one of the tournament, he wasn't sure whether he'd catch a fish. So he got onto something. He wrote it all the way through. And I think he weighed 11 pounds on the final day. I don't think anybody in our field feels like, you know, it's when you like, I think he thought he won Pickwick. And then Bill Lowen caught an eight and a half pounder in the last few hours. Um, right. Those ones hurt a little more. So I, I think Brock was, was pretty cool with it, but um, I mean, you're never cool with it, but I mean, there is also at the rest of the field, everybody, but one other person, you know, would take that second place. Um, I mean, if you're going to get used to loot, you know, losing first place or coming in second, if, if you're going to, you can take it two ways. You can either let it get into your head and eat your brain and, and cause you to spiral downward, or you can understand that, dude, I'm, I've, I've come in second place five times. How close was I to having five blue trophies under my belt right now? Yeah. And that, which is like Brandon Polnick level, right? And knowing this is the, t- his time is going to come and have the confidence in himself to continue doing what he's been doing to put himself in the situation to win. I think he feels that. And, and, you know, Jason Christie had had some words with him too. I don't know what he said. I'm sure they were encouraging and he probably shared his own experiences. And I was down at the uh, boat ramp. Jason was, he had to uh, fill his live well back up because he had those, you know, his fish in his boat. So he backed his, I actually backed his truck down in the, in the water for him. And I came out, he had his uh, classic trophy in his truck, which I had never, we had, we had missed taking a, a photo together yep. with his classic trophy. So he pulled it out and we were taking a photo and Brock Mosley walks by, you know, everyone's leaving. He got his check and he's walking back to his, his rig to leave. And he looked over and he just started laughing. He pointed at Jason and he goes, oh, it's you again, that guy. And he was joking, but it was in good spirits. And you could tell that it, it, it bothered him, but it really didn't bother him because he, know, he knows it's coming. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I know in that situation, I mean, it's just like when you tell, I told Jason that before. It's coming. This is building towards something. But I'm sure when you're in that situation, you just feel like, well, when? When? Because I'm tired right. of waiting. It's, right, exactly. <laughs> it's not on your schedule. Um, it's not like a baby's coming. There's like a, a you know, a, a delivery date. <laughs> this yeah. is like something that it could go. I mean, John Cruz took him 10 years to win his second one, right? Yeah, yeah. You don't get to choose. Um, you That's just got to right. do your job and uh, it will happen. It will happen. Um, speaking of getting in people's heads, um, I didn't even know if I should tell this story. So I walk off the stage and um, dude, it's just, it's so amazing that no matter what you do, it's always the negative that you feed off. So I walk off the stage and this dude comes up to me um, and there's a whole bunch of people telling me I do a good job and I was thankful for every one of them. So some dude comes up, puts his arm around me and I probably shouldn't talk to people when I first get off stage. Cause you're kind of like just, I mean, I go to a weird place. up. You know what I mean? Like it, it, it's what I do up there. Can't be, I mean, I just, I don't know. You, there's a stage place that you go and then takes you a few minutes. Like when I come into the media trailer afterwards, all the writers hate me. Cause I'm just like, arr, arr, just, you know what I mean? You got to slowly come down. I mean, right. unless you're Elvis, we do the same thing when we get off the boat, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's yeah. Cause you want it and you want to fill everyone in and stuff and whatever. So, um, so some dude comes up to me and he's like, uh, we're Zona, which, which people ask me all the time. And, <laughs> and I, I, you once said I was going to get his shirt said, uh, Zona will be here on Friday or whatever, when he used to come <laughs> to the events. And I said, well, he's in studio. I'm used to answering that. And he's like, he's like, they need to bring back Zona. And I said, well, with live, he's in studio. And he's like, no, 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 they need Zona here. He said, uh, you know, you're okay, but you know, Zona, Zona would be better to be up there. And I'm like, and I didn't even know how to respond. Like I just looked at him. I said, really? And I said, uh, you know, we did, uh, I didn't, I felt like saying you, we do two different jobs and Zona's one of my best friends on earth or whatever. And, 
But all I could come up with at the time is, is I just looked at him and I said, you're a Richard. And I didn't <laughs> use the word Richard. Um, and uh, he looks at me and I'm like, really? You are a Richard. And <laughs> I just walked away because I'm just like, well, what? Maybe he's trying to be funny. I don't know. But then, uh, then I have focused on that enough that I'm talking about it a couple of days later. Hey, so. man, when you came up to me, like you came around the backside of the crowd, and you came up to me and you were explaining to me what just happened. I think it had just happened, right? Yeah, yeah. And I looked up at you, and like the redneck came out of me. Like <laughs> we're friends, and I, I, dude, I commit to my friendships, right? They're, yeah. My friends are my friends. I would <laughs> die and go to war with my friends. And when you told me that, I was like, the first thing I said was, who, who was he? Like, I just wanted to go kick him in the balls. <laughs> I mean, what a, what a Richard. Yeah, totally. Why Richard. do people do that? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I think people sometimes don't know what to say. And maybe he was trying to be funny, but I, I feel like I gave him plenty, plenty of opportunity to clarify it, Like, I mean, he kept coming and trust me, I do think Zona would be great to have events. I miss Zona being at the events, but it was just a weird, it's just a weird thing. Um, so, uh, it also too, I want to, exp I want to say this too, from a, from a fan's perspective and I'm listening to live all day long. And I think, you know, we, and everyone knows this, but I'm going to say it out loud that it's a different, it's a different show now. And we're live. I mean, my first event 11 or 12 years ago now uh, Zona and Tommy Sanders yeah. were on stage behind a podium at, at the, at the weigh-ins. Right. Yeah. And, and now with all the live activities going on and all the switching back and forth during the breaks, you and Davey come on, everybody's got a different niche and a different color that they bring to the table. And I find that, that it makes the show better. And, and, you know, you're not just a stage guy, I mean, you're an angler too, and you do what you do. You're fact sufficient by all means, right? And so, what again, I know you don't like praise, Dave, but in the midst of what happened backstage uh, on Sunday, you know, everybody's got a, a, a part in this gig, and yours is, is a huge part of it. And I love watching it. So, do a lot of people. So, thank you, Dave. Yeah. Well, th uh, thank you. That makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I'm just a normal person, so I do, obviously don't focus on all the praise and nice. I mean, a whole bunch of people like every time you come off the stage, the amount of I always think it'd be cool if like UPS drivers and people with normal jobs got to feel what I I mean, people clap when I just walk out. It's awesome. It's 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 but one dude <laughs> that Richard and uh, I mean, I'm going to assume he's not listening to this, but um, <laughs> I hope he does. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I, that'd be interesting too. Um, but anyways, it, uh, it was a great tournament. Um, we try to bring you guys behind the scenes and show you kind of these little nuggets of things that happen. Some of them good, some of them bad. Um, but there were some big nuggets that we need to save for another show. And we're going to do that. And we're going to have a special out of literally this one story. So I hope it lives up to it. Everybody might watch it and be like, that wasn't that this good. Why did they make a special yeah. out of it? But, this is um, weird. <laughs> it is weird, and it is shocking, and it's going to be – I'm going to post it on Friday. So same thing, you get this every Wednesday at 6. We'll post that Friday at 6 o'clock. So it's going to be – we're double-deucing <laughs> Jake's take <laughs> this week. Um, you got anything else from the event, Jake? Are we done? I think we're done. That was That was fun. I hey, can't wait. You, it's, it's a month between now and fork. Yeah. And I, it's like, dude, what am I going to do for a month? <laughs> I'm going to get my boat out and start fishing. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that'd be a good idea. Um, you'll probably be back on here a bunch of times. I mean, <laughs> um, I'll miss you. Um, all right. Hey, you got any Greg Hackney stories? Greg Hackney is the most. Have you ever spent time with, have you ever shot for him? Oh yeah. I, uh, Greg and I are pretty pretty good friends. I mean, enough to where we cut up, we cut up when, you know, I'm in his boat and he, I will say this about Greg Hackney. He's the most thorough angler that I've ever covered. I mean, I saw him make 12 casts into one lay down on Pickwick last year. 
And he kept saying, I knew, I, I know there's a, I know there's a big one in there. And he kept throwing, he kept throwing in there, throwing in there, throwing in there, boom, like on his 12th cast, he catches a five pounder. And that was the infamous stand down clip. <laughs> And, and, and so, yeah, Greg Hackney is very thorough. He knows where the big fish are and he's another one of those guys in that intimidation, uh, category, like Jason Christie, like you don't want that guy behind you. If you're in the top three on day four, you don't want him behind you. Cause he's going to catch him. Yeah. You don't want him behind you. And he is because our next guest in this show, <laughs> our headlining guest, the hack attack, Greg Hackney. Greg Hackney, I'm excited to do this. I mean, th th this is when I started doing this silly little podcast. It's super innovative. It's a new thing in fishing. Don't know if you've heard of it, but podcasting. When I got into this, you were one of the guys that uh, that I was like, I'd like to talk to Greg, get to know him a little bit deeper. Does that excite you or alarm you? Uh, probably a little of both. <laughs> I don't think I'm alarmed. I don't get alarmed much. <laughs> you don't. You don't. You're. Um, would I be wrong in saying that I find you even more chill now than before? Do, oh yeah. You yeah, I'm in a def definitely in a different place in my life right now. Is that age, or is that experience, or is it just a combination of all of the above? I think it's a combination of all of the above and uh, uh, I'm just real comfortable too, you know, and maybe that's an age thing. I don't know. I just woke up one morning and was comfortable with my life, which is a good thing. Very it's great. Popular. It's a great place to be. I mean, most people spend their life not being comfortable. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that. And I have struggled with that too. Uh, you know, I just think it's, People in general, we're hard to be satisfied with anything that we do. I, you know, like I think you look at a lot of guys that are at the top of the sport and whatever sport it may be, and deep down inside, I think most of them, are, you know, it's hard to be happy. It's, 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 it's a funny thing because, you know, a lot of people look at people that do, whether they're fishing for a living or playing baseball or whatever they're doing like and a lot of people are like man I'd really like to do that but when when you get in that position it's not like what they think it is it's not the life that most people think it is you know and uh, I think we just put a lot of pressure on ourselves and I think I've done that for the last 20 years and I um I actually had a conversation with Julie today on the way up here that I'm not doing that anymore I'm gonna be happy with what I got and the way things you know have worked out for me and I'm uh, I'm very satisfied and I'm having a lot of fun. Well, would you say that part of not being happy with what you got is what got you what you got? You know what I mean? As crazy as it is, like I think that's also a trait in successful people because you you're driven. You want to keep charging, so you're never almost satisfied. Right. Yeah. Well. So here's the deal. Here's the biggest problem with you know what we do. There's only one guy that leaves from every event completely satisfied. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. One guy. And uh, out of the hundred of us or 94, whatever it is, whatever the number is at each event, there's only one guy, you know, but it's kind of that deal. I told you at the classic, the, the, I have made a deal with myself that as long as my, I felt like my decision making was good and I didn't make any mistakes, I was going to be happy with the outcome of the events, you know, regardless. And that, that has helped me mentally. Now, with that being said, well, yeah, do I want to win every one of them? A hundred percent. That none of that has changed. It's just that I don't know how to explain that. I'm just a little more comfortable with being me now than I have been in the past. When uh, do you think you were in your most uncomfortable state? Like, like be, beginning your career? Is that natural to say? Yeah. You know, like when people, people well, first want to fit in, I guess? I don't think it's the beginning. I think more, I would say more of your <laughs> sophomore and junior year is when I is actually when I feel like that I put the most pressure on myself. And uh, I, I can't, I don't really know why that is, but it seemed like the more I fish, the more pressure I put on myself. You know, I went through that period of time that, 
And I think everybody does that. I don't think it was just me. I just think that's fishermen in general. I, Cause I, I, <laughs> it's a funny thing, but, and I, again, this comes back to age, I guess, but watching guys now and watching them at the different ages from, you know, their first year in their second year in, I see guys putting their self through that pressure. Yeah. It's, <laughs> I like to sit back and watch them like, well, I know what they're, I know what they're going through. You know, I don't envy that because I've been there and done that, but I, I see that with guys like, and it, it really seems like if you look like guys first year or two out here, they are so happy. You know what? They're living a the dream. You know, they're getting to the fish. That's all they want to yeah. do. Is, hear guys say that all I want to do is fish. Okay. Well that goes away, you know, it goes away because then all of a sudden they've gotten to the point where, you know what, just fishing doesn't make them happy anymore. Now they want to win every time, you know, and then that's when they start to put all that pressure on themselves. And I see, and I'm not calling any names, but there are a couple guys fishing right now that, you know, that are like friends of mine and they're, they're in that, they're in that point right now in their career where they're, you know, third year, second year, third year, fourth year, somewhere in that period of time. And they're, I can tell by the way they act and their mood that they're putting as much pressure that they possibly can put on themselves. And we're, we're our own worst critics. You know, you know what I mean? Like yeah. nobody criticizes us as individuals more than we do ourselves. And I just, I think it's funny. <laughs> I'm like, I'm glad I'm not you anymore. <laughs> don't, let, don't do that. Either. You know, do you, do you think you made it tougher on yourself because of how, I mean, when you came on the scene, I mean, I'm pretty sure you almost won Angler of the Year in both leagues. <laughs> you you tore it up. So do you, do you think that the more hotter you come out of the gates, almost the tougher? Yeah, no. Doubt. You always want to step up, and if you start up, it's hard to make that next step. Yeah, because you know the deal is once you're up there at the top, there's only one place to go. It's hard to yeah. stay maintain that. This group is so good, and you know that's the other thing. And I I say that every year, but. The fishermen are better now than they were when I started on average. You know what I mean? The average Bassmaster Elite guy is much better than they were, you know, my first year, you know, or in my first couple of years, whatever, my rookie season. And uh, and it's just it just gets harder and harder and harder. And you just get in that deal where you just keep putting more and more pressure on yourself. And the other fishermen being so much better and there's so much more you know, they, they know so much more now at a much younger age. Cause when I started, you know, uh, I would read Bassmaster and then like whatever won an event and then have to go out there on the water and decipher the, you know, what I read and, you know, learn how to do that or whatever. And now a guy can actually watch a guy win a tournament on live and be doing that that afternoon. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? So the learning curve now is, it's crazy, you know, what, you know, what guys know now that it took me, you know, so much trial and error to learn stuff. And now a guy can just watch it and they're so good. They can just go right out there and do it and apply it. So a lot of that, all that together is just what's making our deal a lot harder. And, uh, you know, because our group is so good, we cannibalize one another, you know, yeah. that's, uh, but, but like I said, I'm a, I'm still part of this rat race, but I'm just enjoying it a lot more now. And probably it's, it's kind of funny. It's kind of come full circle in that when I first came out here, you know, I was just happy to get to fish for a living. Yeah. And I'll be honest with you. I'm back to that point. I'm just happy to be able to fish for a living, you know, again. Does that make you tougher to compete against or easier? Oh, I just think it keeps me a lot more laid back. And I think when I'm a lot more laid back that, I potentially am more dangerous that way, you know, because I'm not putting any pressure on myself. I'm just going fishing. And that's what, that's the feeling I like. You, you know what I mean? I'm getting, I'm, I'm looking forward to the next event, wherever that may be. I'm looking forward to being here this week. And, you know, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward that we've got some time between now and four before it goes yeah. off. I'm actually going to go pre fishing, you know, which is something that I've not done a lot of in the, in the past, but I just feel like on that particular body of water is something that would help me, you know? So those are the things that I'm, you know, I, uh, I don't know. I'm just looking forward to going fishing every day. I'm loving every minute of it, you know? 
And I think always when you love something is truly when you're best at it. You know what I mean? Because you're, you're fresh, you're obsessed with it. You're not out there thinking, I got to figure out how to make it through this tournament. You're enjoying every bit of it. I would imagine it would make anybody more lethal. You know, I enjoy working on my tackle. Like, so I'm going to enjoy in the morning, just getting up and going out there and spending the day, you know, working on my boat and truck, getting everything ready to start practice on Sunday. And, uh, you know, I looked some of the weather this week is not like great, you know, mm -hmm. we, good days and some bad days. But like now I look at the weather and, and it's just like, well, you know what? I'm just going to fish in the moment. I don't care what the weather's like, you know, so it really doesn't matter. It doesn't bother me. I had that deal in the fact, oh, the cold front's coming or whatever, you know, and I would let that stuff mentally bother me. Now I'm just like, you know what? That's just part of it. It is what it is, you know? It's cool. It's cool. I felt like you were different at the classic and it's funny because I talked to Christy about it and he identified himself as being different at the classic. Just there, there was you, Christy. And I mean, swindle really stood out. It almost felt like, and it was the group that is coming back. And it, it just felt like all of a sudden we had some folks competing in the classic that were partying during the classic, but there yeah. was a group that was, <laughs> Almost like it, the classic became more valuable to you. Did I read that correctly? Yeah, the uh, it, it's it's funny that you say that. Like, so that was my sixteenth Bassmaster, yeah. class, and I probably enjoyed that one without a shadow of a doubt more than any Bassmaster Classic I've ever been to. Wow! And uh, and I'll tell you, the big reason was I just enjoyed the experience. I yeah. didn't put extra pressure on myself like I probably had in the previous 15 times and uh you know my family came I don't know it was just a good time now did I want to win definitely and I thought you know I'll be honest with you, I was pretty fired up after the first day because I thought you know I, I survived some conditions that were different from practice and uh I put myself in position I actually thought I had a you know a legitimate shot you know to win the classic too but regardless of that I never felt any I never felt any more pre the, in the past. The classics always felt like I had a lot more pressure on me than I would say a regular season event. And uh, I felt like that was one of the reasons that like my performance in the classics have not been very good because I'm like, if I could just fish the classic, like say I did Santee Cooper, you know, yeah. or you know, other places where I just, you know, and this time I felt better about it because I never felt any extra pressure. You know, even having the camera the first day of the classic didn't put any extra pressure on me. You know what I mean? Like, I was really glad I had a camera because I'm like, if it goes down, they're going to get to see it. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was, I don't know. I don't know. I've really enjoyed this Bassmaster Classic, you know, and I'm, uh, and again, this year is probably, I've had some other goals this year besides just making the classic, but one of, if not the biggest goal of mine this year is to make it back to the classic again. I, I, uh, I kind of have a goal that as long as I fish, I just want to make the classic. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I want to make every one of them. I, you know, and if it takes 25 of them, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I'm like, I still want to win the classic. That's, that is the tournament that still drives me as far as what keeps me out here or whatever. But, um, I'm going to enjoy everyone from here on out too. You know, that's another thing. I told myself that regardless of this year, how the classic turned out, I was going to enjoy it. And I did. And I didn't over party. Like there were some Northern anglers, you know, that I hear rumor on the street was, it was a big party going on. I enjoyed it, but I, I didn't go quite so far with it. <laughs> <laughs> what does watch Jason Christie win the classic? What goes through? And I know you're going to give me the, like, it was great to see him win it and everything, but as <laughs> I you, when I was, <laughs> no, oh, good. I like this. Good. Give me the truth. Then, what goes through your head watching him win? Well, I'm like, if he can win, surely I can. <laughs> I mean, he is the guy that caught one bass in the next tournament. I'm like, oh, I don't. That I'll tell you what. It doesn't surprise me that Christy won the classic. It surprises me that he only caught one bass at Santee Cooper, probably the finest lake in the United States. That I was shocked by the first day when he only weighs in one or whatever, I, I was totally blown away by that. But no, Christy is a fierce competitor. I don't have any fear of him. You know, I, I would have really liked to have been the man right behind him going into the last day, but, uh, 
but yeah, hey, I, it does not surprise me at all that he won. You know, he'd won on that lake before. Undoubtedly, you, you know, it's funny how certain places suit guys. Yeah. He he's always done well there. You know, I mean, I uh, now I did feel like if he didn't win this time after he was leading after the second day that he probably should quit. You know, <laughs> I mean, I don't know how many chances you can get that are that good, but uh, but he has like it's 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 funny how certain lakes suit certain guys. And I guess realistically that lake uh, in some kind of ways is probably similar to grand. You know what I mean? Or similar yeah. to a lot of the, I mean, kind of like his home lake, you know, uh, Oklahoma guys do really well there for what, they, for whatever you look at all Oklahoma guys, it sets up well for them. Yes, it does. And it's funny how certain part of the country just suits certain guys, you know, and yeah. like, there he's always done well and he won an flw there and he almost won the classic uh you know the time before when i was there so i mean i that i wasn't really shocked i expected him to be a player in the deal you never know who's gonna win but i, I would if if you'd have asked me if if i was thinking he was gonna be in the top five when it was over it was no doubt you know i would i expected that 100 percent. and i kind of got that same feeling this time that when he was leading after the second day i felt like he he was probably going to win because again, he, when I saw him that morning, the last morning going out, he had a different look in his eye. You know what I mean? Like he was like a deer in a headlight, the classic before there, but this time he just looked normal. Like he normally does. And I was like, yeah, he's probably gonna be hard to beat, you know, but, but watching him win, what emotion does that do? Does that motivate you more? Does that, you know, like, or is it just when it's my time, it's my yeah. time. Um, it's my time. I, I hate you, that. Classic is such a weird, I can't explain that, but the classic is such a different event that, you know, things have just never really lined up for me. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I, I finished fifth there like a long time ago in a classic. And I was one bite away that last day from, and that's probably the only time it's ever really went right. I don't know. Like this time, you know, the last day, I mean, I was like, the only chance I had it was out. And here's the funny thing. I knew exactly how much weight I needed the last day. And had I caught that weight, now I didn't, I wouldn't like I needed 25 pounds. I, I had figured it up. I needed 23. <laughs> so I knew exactly what I needed the last day. And But I, you know, I felt like, yeah, it was a chance. Yeah. Was it possible? Yeah. But it wasn't likely, you know, just because that's a tough fishery to catch a bag that big on. Um, uh, but I feel like if I just keep going, eventually, <laughs> you know. So that's the reason I'm I'm gonna try to get to Knoxville. I, I believe I believe it will happen. I, I have faith in you. I don't know if that gives you more faith or not, but I do. I mean, I, I said the same thing to Jason. I'm like, there's certain anglers that I don't think it's a question of if, it's a question of when. And and the only way it won't happen is if you. Stop chasing it. You know what I mean? You almost did, but you're back. You ride at the ship and it's good to have you back. So yeah, you, be I really honest with you about that. I don't know without the classic if I'd have came back. You yeah, know? I agree. And I'll tell you another thing that I missed was history. Yeah. Now, that other organization eventually make their own history. Yeah. But you know what? I've been a part of this history since the beginning of my career. And I've been reading about this history my entire life. And without this history, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. You know what I mean? So I was yeah. like, you know, let those other boys make that history. I'll just come back over here where I'm already part of history. And this is where I want to be. So, uh, And the classic was, you know, by far, man, I could not wait to roll back through that Coliseum. That's probably the most, that was the greatest feeling when they opened the door the first day of the classic. And I rolled in. Now it helped that I had some fish too, you know, but, but just that, cause I had listened to the vote that went right before me. And I was like, man, I'm ready to do that again. You know, yeah. so, so good times. Let's go way back. Cause I've never asked you this. Uh, and I, I mean, I've probably yelled it beside you many times and I'm sure you're tired of hearing me. The whole Godzilla ain't got nothing on me line. It is one of the most iconic lines in bass fishing history. Where did that come from? It, it, it did. I mean, was it pre-planned? And are you shocked at how timeless that has become? 
So here's the deal. I have no idea where it come from. And I wondered if <laughs> the how I'm like, can't figure out why I did that. Like, so, so here's the deal. Like now I will tell you this and I have fought this demon a lot. I am a very an emotional person when I get jacked up. Yeah. Okay. Like and fishing will jack you up because we're all adrenaline junkies. You know what? That's the reason we do it. I mean, there is a feeling that it gets, I mean, there's a feeling you get from catching a fish, whatever. And then there's a feeling that you get of catching one in a Bassmaster tournament. And if you could bottle that, I definitely wouldn't have to fish anymore. You <laughs> know what I mean? Like, I, I can't even explain that. And people who've never done it, I, I, you know, I don't know how to explain that, what that feeling is. But where that came, and I was a big Godzilla fan growing up as a kid. But I have no idea where that came from. You know, it was almost like I didn't know what to say. So I just said something. <laughs> oh, I was jacked up. And I thought I was going to win. You know, that was the other thing. Because so th there's a lot goes into that deal. So the whole so that day before would have been the third day. And in that hole, I never caught a fish. Like I, that was the only hole in, in the 10 holes that we were fishing in because it was that mega bucks format. That was the only hole that I didn't catch a fish in. And uh, I figured out how to catch them in that hole that day. And so the deal was that big one was the last one I caught because I had already, I had broke one off, caught a three pounder, caught a four pounder, and then caught that one. It was like right at seven. And so there was it, that I was leading up to that moment. If you know what I mean, like, because I, I, no, I, I catch two. I catch two. One, like I said, one of those was a four pounder. So I'm already jacked up. Yeah. And then the catch is a seven pounder. So my emotions. And again, this was early on in my career where I was very, very emotional anyway. Like I'm still very, very emotional. But now I learn how to, you know, focus that in a positive way. You know what I mean? Like not to get too jacked up just control your emotions, you know, and use it in a positive way. And then I was just jacked up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it's incredible. I mean, it's a, it's a great line. And I, I totally know how that can happen because I did. I mean, I'm once on my show and that's not even competing, but I caught like a 500 pound grouper and then during while fighting it, for no particular reason that I can't ever explain, I started singing, I am the walrus, coo -coo -coo -coo. I don't even know where it came from, but, and I didn't even know I did it, to be honest, until after I watched the footage, and I'm like, I mean, I know I act a fool, but, like, I had no memory of it, so I could see how that could happen, but uh, it's one of the coolest lines in the history of the sport, really, like, it, it it's timeless. So now the only way I can watch the clip is to mute it. I can't watch it. Why? You I've just been, dislike? It's, a, it's always kind of embarrassed me. So I've never been able to watch it really since. When they play it, I'll turn my head. I'm like, oh, my gosh. And it has been played a lot. <laughs> I'm going to go now because that would have been – that was my rookie season. So that, that was in 2004. Yeah. It, 18 years ago. Yeah, a lot of water been under the bridge since then. But I feel like it's one of those things that, like, you get embarrassed by it. But if, like, there was a top ten list came out of the most iconic angler celebrations, you weren't included. You might also be insulted at the same time. Am I? Yeah. Would I read that right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no. It uh, it's one of the coolest coolest signs. So you were a big Godzilla fan growing up. You not anymore, or still a Godzilla oh, yeah. fan? You, you know, here's the deal. I'm a I, I'm on the fence about Godzilla. I'm more of a King Kong fan now than I am Godzilla. I like the new King Kong movies. I like Skull Island. I like now. I've not watched. Uh, I have not seen King Kong versus Godzilla and I can't, you know, that that's one of those deals where I don't know if I want to watch that or not, because I'm like, I'm for both sides. So there's no winner. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? It kind of house divided. So I'm like, I don't really know if I want to watch that or not. It's, it's funny. Oh, I don't want to spoiler alert it on you. Well, who do you think wins? Who do you like? If you had to bet on one of them, you'd about have to bet on Godzilla. You, you know what I mean? Like if you, I mean, <laughs> Godzilla blows flames. <laughs> you know what I mean? 
King Kong's a monkey. You know, yeah, has, a big one, but still a monkey. A strong monkey, but I mean, still, you know, a fire breathing dragon or a monkey. You know, I'm gonna go with the dragon. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's a good and and I mean you're, you're Greg Hector. You have to go with Godzilla. I mean, at the end of the day, if you pick, I mean, your whole that iconic line and everything that you're embarrassed about. Do you believe in Sasquatch? Uh, you know, here's the deal with that. I would like to. I would like to believe that that is real, but man, it'd be like in a part of the country that I grew up in. If there was one, somebody'd have one hanging in the shed. <laughs> <laughs> over and look you know what I mean? So that's the only thing. There's a part of me that wants to believe, but the other part is like, man, somebody would have uh, captured one if it was out there. You know, <laughs> I hate to go buzzkill on that, but I'm like, I spent a lot of time in the woods and I just believe that if he was out there. Now, he, I, and I mean in our country, you know what I mean? In North America. Now, there are yeah. some big woods like in your area, you know, Alaska, places where, yeah, maybe, but still, there's not too many places in North America now that somebody hasn't set foot, flew over, explored, you know, whatever, you know what I mean. So, yeah, I'd like to, but I'm, I'm afraid it doesn't, it's not going to happen. Well, would you, if you did while you were out hunting, um, you know, everyone knows you love, love hunting. If you were out and it came out, w- would you shoot the Yeti or would you just... Take a you great really? cell phone picture and <laughs> Are, yeah, we get a selfie with him if that answers your question. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all come over to my house. I want to show you what I got hanging in the shed. <laughs> <laughs> you only get one shot at a yeti. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it could happen. As a competitor. I've always wondered this. Everybody else, everybody listening to this podcast, everybody that competes. To them, the day is a constant war of battles in their heads, voices telling them to do things. Do you still, at this point in your career, with everything you've accomplished, do you still hear those voices, whether it be negative or positive, or do you just tell the voice to shut up? I'm Greg Hackney. Oh, uh, I don't really. Yeah, yeah, I don't really. I, I pretty much do what I think. You know what I mean? Like, um, ah, I still move pretty well in that, you know, I, I don't mind just completely abandoning what I've been doing. Yeah. You, you know, I always rig up for the moment. Um, uh, like I, I'm just a true believer in fishing in the moment. You know what I mean? Like don't force anything. Like I, I do believe that because I have done that in the past, you know, force your practice. And I just don't do that much anymore. Like, I don't mind just up and, and rolling. I can do that. Um, yeah, I don't really, like I said, I, you know, and, and probably that just comes from experience and age and not don't fight it. You, you know what I mean? When something is, you know, focuses you in the right direction, you just go with that. You just comp- completely abandon what you've been doing and you just roll, you know, and don't get locked into anything. You can't, especially – Probably more so, you, you know, it all of that depends on time of the year, too, because yeah. like right now, you cannot be locked into anything thing is every. Of course, things are changing daily, but they're more or less right now changing on the hour, you know. And uh, so this for me, this is an easy time of the year for that. You know what I mean? To rig up, you know, 10 or 15 rods and you don't know which one's going to be the player that day until you get out there just see the conditions. So yeah, I don't really have a lot of de- Like I don't really deal with that much. The mental, I don't really have any mental, you know what I'm, everybody has a mental problem, yeah. but, but I mean, like I don't, I don't really fight with that when I'm fishing. Is, is, is fishing like the area where you feel free? Do you think like, is that, and, it, nope, and nope. has that totally changed through your entire career? I would imagine too. No, the most happiest place I now have this, I, like, so I, I, I do love to hunt and that's a really, and that, that's a, you know, a happy place for me hunting or, but nothing is, nothing beats me in a boat. You know what I mean? Like it's a good feeling. Like yeah. always really, it always really hits me. Like after I've not been fishing for a while and just getting in the boat and unloading the boat, and getting out on the lake, it just, yeah, I, I really enjoy practice because that's probably when, uh, 
there's no time constraint. I don't have to be in a hurry and I can just, you know, enjoy the outside and fishing and nature. And, uh, that's probably my favorite time, you know, on the water is during our practice when I don't, you know, I can just put, put around and, you know, absorb everything. Yeah. Yeah. That yep. makes sense. So, no doubt. Like, cause like I said, I, I do, I truly love to hunt. And I've always joked that I fit, you know, I, I chose to fish where I could be off during hunting season, but, and hunting season is really good for me, but it's not like fishing season, if that makes sense. You know, that I love them both, but hunting second and fishing's first. Makes sense. Makes sense. Do you like the fact that you're one of the intimidating dudes or maybe the most intimidating guy out there? Um, yes, I love that. <laughs> If that's true, I don't know if that's true or not, but it sounds good. I like the way it sounds. Uh, I'm pretty sure if we put like an anonymous poll, because we like to take polls and votes and stuff like that. If we did that and we were like, I'm sure you're making top. I, I think I don't know who beats you other than Rick Clun, but it's a different type of, type of intimidation. That's more. It's Mr. Miyagi. You don't want to mess with Mr. Miyagi, but but is OK. Let me ask you this is intimidation a tool in professional angling? Uh, I guess it could be, but I, if, if, if I, if I do exude any of that, it, it's natural. You know what I mean? It's just personality. I, you, you know what I mean? It's not like I'm just me. Yeah. You know? it, it's not something you're acting to be. It's just you being you. It's just me being me. I am a very, like I do now, I do know this. Like I'm very, I don't want to say hard headed, but you know, when we, when it comes, like I, like, so I love our whole group, but when it comes to the fishing end of, I'm out to get you. I mean, yeah. you know what I mean? Like that's, I don't feel like I could, if I didn't feel that way, I would not be able to be out here. You know what I mean? Like, I think if you don't feel that way, it, you never chase this. You be, you right. take a regular job. You know, you just, it, it's the need. I would assume pro fishing for most people, it's the need to push yourself or, you know, like at some point fishing just wasn't enough. You had to put it on steroids and, and competition seems to be the best way to do that. Is that the right yeah. way to read it? Yeah, it probably is because I love to fish, but I didn't know how much I loved to fish until, uh, so I, I grew up, my father and I, my father was an avid bass fisherman, but he didn't fish bass hunts. So we actually started doing that together. And, uh, cool. and so, man, I, I love the fish, but once I found out what tournament fishing was, then it went to another level, like, you know, and it was something that honestly, that I was naturally good at, you, you know what I mean? Just fishing yeah. because I loved it. I don't know if it came natural. It's just because I loved it so much or whatever. But like at a young age, you know, I caught lots of fish and I, and, but when I started doing it competitively, like it went to another level, you know, like, I mean, I, I promise you now, I, I've always, now I'm not saying I've always given it a hundred percent, but early on, I probably gave it 200%. Like there was a time in my life when there was nothing else you know, of course, time changes as you get older and there's a lot of other things going on or whatever. But when I really first started competitively fishing, there was nothing else. I no. mean, like, you, and here was another deal. So I grew up hunting and fishing. And then I would say when I really started fishing competitively, whether it was bass clubs or, you know, draw tournaments, we fish buddy tournaments, I fish big bass tournaments, we fish everything. Like I probably went, I don't know, a 10 or 15 year period where very, other than some duck hunting, I very little hunting. I went, I fished year round all winter. Cause I grew up in part of the country that every now and then it would get, uh, so I grew up in Southeast Arkansas and every now and then we'd have winters where, you know, there'd be a week or two that it was hard to get a bite. It just gets so cold, you know? And it, I mean, we even had times when the lakes froze over there, but other than that, I pretty much fished 365, you know, during that period of time. I was obsessed with it, you know. You, um, you grew up in Star City, Arkansas, correct? Is that? I did. God, I wish you, I kind of wish you still lived there just 
so I could say from Star City, Arkansas. But <laughs> Gonzalez is strong too. Gonzalez yeah. is strong. Um, so I'm but, almost to the point in life where I've lived. At, at, as of right now, I still live longer in Arkansas than I have Louisiana, but it's it's almost to the 50-50 point now. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm almost to the point where I've lived as long in uh, Louisiana as I have Arkansas. So uh, my mother still lives in uh, Arkansas. My sister lives in Arkansas. Um, but Arkansas was a great place for me to grow up to be a bass fisherman because, you know, I told uh, Stetson Blake like this the other day that uh, – when I grew up as a kid, there were more professional bass fishermen from the state of Texas by far than any other state. But yeah. every year, there were more classic contenders from the state of Arkansas than any other state. Like, so when I grew up in Arkansas, bass fishing in Arkansas was huge. Like, I, I remember the boat dealership in Pine Bluff, Sportsman Haven they were either number one or number two every year in javelin bass boat sales when I was growing up. Like that's how big bass fishing was in the state of Arkansas. And probably some of that was in 84 when the classic was at Pine Bluff, which was 45 minutes north of my house. That really seemed like bass fishing was already big before then but it just completely exploded in the state of arkansas after the classic came there like it was unbelievable how big it was you know <laughs> i mean every house you went by had a bass boat under it at that time you know what i mean like it was weird to know people who didn't bass fish <laughs> I mean, it was crazy. And another thing was a cool thing. I grew up on the Arkansas River. That's my home water. But it was, it had been dammed, the river had been dammed up in like, in the late 70s. And so it was like a new fishery, you know. So I got to grow up there, like when I got big in a fish or whatever, when the river was the best it, you know, it was yeah. like, I mean, I'll be honest with you then, there were three 15 pounders caught in the Dumas pool where I grew up at. Uh, I was bass club with it this was a cool thing man i was in the best bass club so i was in a bass club with a guy who had nine bass over 10 pounds mounted one of them was a 13 8 that he caught in a club wow. turn in arkansas river i mean so and he I, I just i it was a perfect scenario for me to become a professional bass fisherman in that man these guys were great fishermen and i was a sponge and uh it's a funny thing they wouldn't talk to uh they wouldn't talk to one another about fishing, but they would tell me everything. <laughs> and this is a funny thing. After a club term, I would hang out with them and they would drink charter 10 and they would tell fishing stories and talk about places and baits and tackle. And I would sit there, I was 16 years old and I would sit there and just suck it all up. Like, so I don't think I could have a, had a better childhood than I had for the way my life has turned out. You know what I mean? For it's just, everything's been perfect. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's, I think that stage in life is something that people don't pay enough attention to. You know what I mean? Like from when you're 16 to like you're 26 or it, you know, it's somewhere in that window, but like, if you can get whatever it is that you're obsessed with, I mean, sometimes at that age, you're obsessed with wrong things and it takes you in a different direction, but if well, you, you can focus your direction, yeah. That 20 year, that 18, 22 year old me was, you know, I, I was fishing, but I, I, I might've been running the roads a little bit too. And I was burning the candle at both ends during that. <laughs> I will say that. <laughs> the reason I'm laughing so hard is I remember my mother giving me an exact speech and using that exact term. You're burning the candle at both ends, son. You can't do that. <laughs> I mean, so it has sentimental I, meaning to me. <laughs> yes. Good times, you know what I mean? Like, that's just uh, that's just growing up. Do you think it's normal to like when you look back at the competitor you were when you first started? Do, do you are you proud of that competitor? Or do you look back at it and be like, man, that dude was a fool? Oh, yeah, I, you know, there's a lot of growing pains, you know, there's a lot of things that I'd like to look back and do over, you know, yeah. but. You know, so, some of that, you, you know, you got to make some mistakes. You, you know what I mean? That's what makes us grow. 
Yeah. I you think know. it's normal, though. I yeah. think it's the reason your testosterone drops. And that's why you can look at it when you're like, when you're 20, you're just pissed off at anybody that gets in your way anywhere. And then by the time you're 30, you're a little less. And by the time you're 40, you're like, I don't have time to fight with you, dude, because it's stupid. <laughs> stupid. <laughs> it. Uh, so what? what is... I want to talk to you about a special relationship that you have. And I consider myself very lucky to have seen this. And I remember the exact moment that like I'd worked for Bass for a little while and you were the hack attack. I didn't really know you that well. And the first time, like I saw the real hackney was at the classic once and Zona and you ended up hanging together and I was hanging with you. And I'm like, these are like two little children together. It's like the, if, if they're apart, they're kind of okay, but you put them together like gremlins with water. You guys have an incredible relationship, and it's awesome to see you both truly yourselves when you're together. Is that, am I reading that right, or is this all just a made for TV relationship? Yeah. It'd be dangerous for us to spend too much time together. We, uh, we, we discuss that occasionally. And, <laughs> For our marriages, it's best that we don't spend too much time together. Yeah, <laughs> we 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 definitely when we get together, we hit it off. Yeah, yeah you 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 have a good time together. It, thing, I don't even want to tell you the story when we started hanging out. It's horrible, but anyway, we just always hit it off. Well, please tell us that story. That's the exact <laughs> story that I want you to tell. Birds of a feather always flock together. Well, that's a. It's definitely a. Uh, that's not always a positive, <laughs> but that's just kind of the way uh, the way it goes. It's funny now. We really don't hang out very much anymore just because of our lives, you know. Um, like recently, I talked to him yesterday. He was headed to the Bass Pro Shops to the uh, World's Fishing Fair. Yeah. Uh, yep. Golly, he was fired up about that. Oh, always, I'm sure. The more people there, the better. He was so <laughs> heard up about that whole deal but uh but like we just talk on the phone occasionally and other than that we not got together this year you know uh, but so does do. that mean when you get together it'll be a little it, it might be messier yes a hair you, the, the hair definitely gets let down when <laughs> uh when we get together we have a good time but we haven't that's it's it's funny you would think we would you know but the cool thing is the way our relationship is regardless if i haven't seen him for six months it's the exact same thing. If I seen him yesterday, you, you know, we just have kind of have that whole, I don't know, even if we haven't seen each other for a while, when we do see each other, it's like we've been together every day. So Zona is a master at that. Like, like to be like you and him have a special relationship, but you watch Zona and he can make people <laughs> do things and, and act ways that they would never do in front of a camera for anybody else. Is that correct? Right or wrong? So here's the deal. He has this very unique characteristic of being able to pull the deepest, darkest secrets that they should not tell. <laughs> and the funny thing is you, you can with him and he's, and he does that. You see it come. Like if you've ever been around him, like he'll just start, he just has a way of him hawing around. And the next thing, you know, a guy's telling something that I'm like, I need to plug my ears. <laughs> I don't know how he does that. So I, so just a case in point, there was a, this gentleman and uh, that I still see on occasion or whatever. And uh, I had been around him several times and very clean cut, you know, everything's cut and dry type deal. And, and so Zona's around him the first time Now I had been around him two or three times or whatever, super great guy, but anything, the next thing I know we're sitting there and him and Zona are having a conversation and the next thing the guy's telling stuff that I'm like, I can't believe it came out of his mouth. And like, it's that deal where I about spit my drink up, you know, when it starts and I just look over at zone and he just, and the funny thing is like, he never cracks a smile or anything. And he almost he, like, he, I seen him do the same thing to some of my competitors. Like, and you were in the car one time when he had one. You know the time I'm talking about. And I'm like, when the guy starts talking, I'm like, oh, my gosh. I can't even believe that he's saying that. You do know that you I, were there. I do. You, yeah, you were I, there. I was there. I was there. I've been there for some cool moments. and Yeah, uh, yeah uh, but he does 
So if this whole, you know, commentating for bass doesn't work out for him, <laughs> he could probably get a, start working for HBO or somebody interviewing people, if you know what I mean. Like, he's perfect for that that role. Oh, I, I think I honestly think he's perfect for any role. Like, no, all joking aside, I think that Mark Zona is one of the most te- – because of what he does, people don't give him cre- – because he jokes around a lot, you know, often po- people don't – focus on what they're doing. I mean, I think that Mark Zona could literally commentate any sport there is out there and, no. and be great at it. Not good. Great at it. So, and, and his knowledge of football is unbelievable. Like his knowledge of professional football is maybe even, it has to rank right up there, if not better of his knowledge of professional bass fishing. Like, it's crazy. Yeah, what's even crazier is he knows that much about football, and yet he's still a Bears fan. <laughs> yeah, bad habits are hard to break, you know. He likes to pull for the underdogs. He, well, he, I guess he has some connection, but he does wear a Raiders hat all the time now, so now who knows? Up, I didn't even know the Bears still played football. <laughs> I don't know if it's considered football, but... Uh, he, uh, I mean, dude, I will say this. One thing about Zona is he is, he will jump on a, a leader quicker than any, like when we, when he used to come to all the tournaments, I used to joke with him because literally we'd go to like the con- local convenience store. doesn't matter where you are. If we're in Alabama, he's buying an Alabama hat. If we're here in Tennessee, he'll wear a Tennessee hat. I mean, he knows how to play up to the locals. He has always done that forever. He's done that. He every time he's ever come to my house, he's always got on an LSU hat or something. <laughs> I mean, like he always he's fishing in Arkansas. He's got a Razorback hat on. You know what I mean? Like he and I'm like, D, you don't even follow follow college football. <laughs> now that I don't think is not uh, other than Michigan. I I don't think his knowledge of college football it's it's real poor. And see, I don't watch a lot of professional football. I'm a much bigger college fan in football than, uh, and probably because where I live, cause we live 30 minutes from death Valley. So, I mean, it, everything around my house bleeds purple and gold, you know, college football is King, you know, where I live at. So, and maybe that's what it is, but even though the saints are 45 minutes from my house, but it's funny, the saint, everybody around my house pulls for the saints, of course. Yeah. And, but Saints football is so big in New Orleans. But, see, I live between New Orleans and Baton Rouge. In Baton Rouge, it's the ti- Go Tigers, you know. It's, All it's collegiate fun. stuff. And, you know, like the classic, we're at Clemson, you know, at Hartwood. And, like, that part of the country, it's all about Clemson football, you know, which we did roll up in a knot, if I do remember the last time we played Clemson. We rolled them up in a knot. I'm, I'm sure we'll hear about it in the comments. Is it? <laughs> Speaking of making something bleed, I've always wondered if if dinosaurs came back, like let's say there was a real Jurassic Park, and you happened to go hunting there, what what dinosaur would you like to target? Would well, it have to be T Rex? <laughs> I mean, that's my favorite part of the movie in Jurassic Park. I think it was the third one uh, when uh, you know the 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 hunter in the that was trapping dinosaurs. All he wanted for payment was a chance to hunt the uh, the buck uh, Tyrannosaurus. Like, that's the coolest part of the whole movie. You know, yeah. he, he's like, that's all he wanted for payment was to get the <laughs> T-Rex. I'm like, well, there you go. I mean, that, <laughs> so if that, if that wasn't, honestly, now I would spend a lot of money if there was a chance to ride in a time machine and go back and see dinosaurs. Yeah. Now, that, that would cost me the farm, you know. Yeah, yeah. that. Yeah, that's huge. <laughs> uh, so, uh, case in point, we spent uh, we spent some time in Branson, uh, and uh, man, a bunch of cool museums in that whole area. Yeah. And like, I, I you know, because I'm a huge science fiction guy, like all of that stuff. But I've always loved dinosaurs, and like, I just love going to museums and seeing all those old you know, the skeletons and then, then, you know, reading about all that stuff. And then there's, there's so it's, it's, it's crazy that our planet has had so many different 
types of animals from between the time of dinosaurs and now, you know, from the time of giant mammals. It's uh, but I really enjoy that stuff. So I, I definitely, if I could, I pay big, big. I would love to do that. So a big sci-fi guy, like, so what, what sci-fi movies would, would I find is in your top 10 or your collection? So at an early age, it, of course, I was a huge star. I've probably seen Star Wars 45 times, but I've seen all the Star Wars movies. So that was at a young age. And then I, and then it was more Predator, all the Predator movies, Alien, uh, like, so even I, like, so it's time for another Alien Predator movie. It's been too long, you know, I, the world is needing that, you know. And then after the whole Prometheus deal, I'm like, all that can be played into another movie. You know, we need more of that, you know, the whole deal. Uh, but when I go home, Jill and I are going to see Morbius. That's probably the only thing out right now that uh, I'm going to the movie theater to see that when after this week of tournament. What, what is Morbius? Sorry, I feel, I, I feel like I'm an idiot You know, right now. It, it was the doctor that was, you know, he had some type of disease. and Oh, yeah, yeah. He, you know, he travels somewhere and finds some bats, get bit by the bat. And <laughs> COVID, no. <laughs> he had a bad strain of COVID, and then he eats somebody. <laughs> it can happen. It can happen. Would you hunt Predator if that was an option? I'd probably have to do that. I would probably rather hunt the Predator than the aliens. Yeah. yeah. I think I, I've, I've said for a while, I think now's the perfect time also for an alien invasion because people are too busy fighting with each other. And I think all we need is one alien ship to land and start smoking a few humans. And all of a sudden, people won't care where you're from or any of that stuff. They just want you to be on the side that's trying to shoot the aliens. You know, big as our universe is around us, it is inevitable that, you know, that we are we are finding life. If that, <laughs> it's inevitable. Yeah. I mean, no way, you know, this, oh, this planet used to have water. This planet, look, well, we see this, we see that. I'm like, either just go ahead and tell us, or it's just inevitable that it's going to happen, you know. So you do know that one of uh, Mark's children just went to work for NASA. Yeah. So I said, the only thing, the only thing I want out of is an alien picture. That's it. <laughs> Just one alien picture. Just one alien picture. I mean, it can be a picture of a hand or a foot. I mean, just some proof. That's all I need. Would you go up on one of those, like, you know how they've, they've got, like, astronaut to pay now? Like, if somebody, like, whoever it is, Bezos or whoever's been bringing people up, if they said, hey, Greg Hackney, would you like to come up for a recreational trip to space? Is that something you'd be excited to do or you're like, I have stay to on land. land? Like, I don't want to just fly through space. I want to go somewhere, you know, and get yeah. off, oh, you know, <laughs> Mars or somewhere. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah. But just as far as just flying in space, yeah, I'm not, I'd like to go somewhere and oh, we found a planet with trees and water and just <laughs> yeah. go little hunting trip i'm like that's exactly what i want to do yeah i i get that I, I mean it's like flying on a plane i mean i want to go somewhere i don't want to just go up in a plane for a ride hey, i mean a circle in an airplane you want to go fly somewhere to a destination and spend a little time and then fly back, back. yeah yeah that totally makes sense totally makes sense uh, does it shock you that I mean, I think it's amazing that one of Zonas, both his boys do it incredibly well, both um, yeah, working yeah. out in California. But but like I never thought I mean, I thought they were destined for the elite series. And and me and Zona argued with that for years because those boys can catch them. But obviously, they're a lot smarter than or or stupider, depending on how you look. at it. I, I'll be honest with you. I think they made a really, really great decision. Yeah. You know. I and and here's the deal with that, they're both so young that realistically, they could always try that and then come back and fish the Elite Series. You're right. There's still time. Yeah, there's still time. I mean, they're very young. And this is such a great time. Like, they're at the age to live life. If that, You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, plenty of time to be serious. And so right now, just 
enjoy yourself. That's what I tell both of my boys. I'm like, don't, you don't have to, you got plenty of time. You're going to grow up fast enough. So as long as you can stay young, stay young. Yeah. Cause adulthood is out there and it's coming. It's inevitable. So just enjoy this period of your life, you know, cause this is the funnest time of your life. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think that's true for everyone. I mean, it, uh, there's, I mean, I love where I'm at, but there is nobody that's like, man, I love being 47. But now, trust me, it's way better than the alternative. But I mean, uh, 27 was pretty awesome, too. Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that next time. Greg, right. I, I thank you for uh, wasting a little part of your day with me here today. Yeah, and I, 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 I kind of thought maybe I was like, well, I've been blackballed from Dave's show. I mean, I'll never get an invite or anything on that. So I was like, I don't, I don't ask, I don't say anything. So I just appreciate the opportunity. You're welcome. Any, any time. And, and trust me, this is how organized it is. It, like, I mean, dude, whoever I'm talking to, I'm like, yeah, you want to do a show this week? I mean, I actually went out of my way and reached out to you specifically, which I mean, well, I, I guess I should have done. I've it enjoyed sooner, it. But I've enjoyed it too. Um, and I can't wait to hear more of your stories. I think I think maybe a later interview next time. Okay. Yeah. Later in the evening. Yeah. That's candid time. Yeah. All Plus right. The- yeah. <laughs> Greg Hackney, thank you very much, and we'll see you soon. All right. See. You. There you have it, Greg Hackney and Jake Latondres. I think that was a pretty. I mean, it was a better show than I ever imagined we'd produce around here. I hope you enjoyed it, and. Uh, Before I tell you to like and subscribe and all that stuff that's going to make us podcast popular, remind you, the super special Jake's Take will be Friday night at 6 o'clock. That's right. I guess it's Good Friday, and this is, um, I don't know if it'll be good, but it's definitely going to be entertaining. You definitely want to tune in this Friday, 6 o'clock. We'll go live on all podcast platforms and YouTube. And remember, this is the part where I have to beg you to like us. Just hit a like. Hit a subscription and um, hit us up Friday at 6 o'clock and listen to the Super Special Jake's Take where it all literally goes down. Uncle Bob, take it away. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to. You hear?